Uh, hey, pull out a Bible today, Matthew chapter 6 and 2 Peter chapter 1. That's where we'll be today. Pull out a Bible. Be with me, digital or physical Bible. If you're watching online, pull out a Bible today. We're going to be in two places, Matthew chapter 6 and 2 Peter chapter 1. One And I will let you find those as I read our theme passage of Scripture for this learning series, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading this from the Amplified. It says, Therefore, God says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine. Make day dawn upon you and give you light. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and the witless, I love that word witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. In September 2020, God gave us a prophetic word that he is positioning us to try Again, And so I went to God and I said, God, if 2021 is us trying again, if this is the first year of a 10-year vision to be the church of 2030, I want to know what I should preach, how I should preach. I said, I'm going to change my attitude about church. Woo! Somebody needed to hear that today. I'm going to change my attitude about church. I'm going to change my attitude about people. I'm going to be the church of 2030. Praise the Lord. Y'all didn't hear that. Y'all missed your amen moment. That's Okay. But we launched this learning series, Awakening, because I want to wake you up to this 10-year vision. I want to wake you up to these things that you need to know as followers of Jesus, some basic things. But we're also going deeper so that we can try again. So last week we learned about our purpose, that we introduce real people to the real Jesus. Today I want to walk you through a message that I've titled, All You Have Is All You Need. All You Have Is All You Need. After my accident in October 2018, I started seeing a chiropractor who unfortunately ended up passing away in 2019. Um, And uh, anyway, so I was seeing an orthopedist, a neurologist, a physician, and my chiropractor on top of that. Um, And someone in our church, uh, someone who I love dearly, blessed me uh, to see a brand new chiropractor that they work with. And my first visit with this chiropractor, and she's very holistic, by the way, most chiropractors are, their goal is to get you off of the medicines you're on. Now, I do believe that there are medicines that we need to take, of course, to remain healthy. Uh, But for me, the medicines that I was taking, I was taking um, a medicine from my neurologist that actually, it actually changes your brain chemistry. And so I would dull out. I had memory loss, things like that. Uh, I had a lot of painkillers, muscle relaxers. And there's a nurse here uh, in our church who would come up to me after a Sunday and be like, are you okay? <laughs> because she saw the signs that I was, had all these medications and, and I would just kind of get through a message. I literally would leave the church and 15 minutes after leaving the church, I would forget what I just preached. I mean, it was just that kind of reality for me. And so I started seeing this chiropractor and the first thing that she said to me was, your body has all it needs to heal. Everything in your body, it has all it needs to heal. We just want to unlock that for you. And that really resonated with me because I know there are some conditions you do need medicine to supplement and to help heal, absolutely. But she said, with your injury, your body has all it needs to heal. We just need to help you unlock that so that you're not having to take all these medicines all the time. And I really appreciated that. But it made me think of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gathers on a mountainside with thousands of people, a crowd of people who say, I want to follow you, and he begins to minister to them. In Matthew chapter 5, we have what's called the Beatitudes. It's the beautiful attitudes. And Jesus begins to say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you when people persecute you. He begins to list this upside down type of life that no matter the season, we are blessed. His attitude was not that you need to be poor. His attitude was not that you need to be at the bottom rung. His attitude is this, that no matter the season of life, you are blessed because you're a part of the kingdom. You have access to things that no one else does. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That word poor means empty. Why would I be blessed if I have an empty spirit? Because only God can fill it. You're blessed. Then in Matthew 6, he starts hitting the threefold cord of the kingdom which is prayer, fasting, and giving. He says, when you pray, when you fast, when you give. He says, you need to pray a certain way. There's a theme to how we pray. We don't just beg God, but we pray in faith. He said, you need to fast consistently. Fasting is when we give up food for a 
season, not, not for our lives, but for a season. Uh, a modern day fast would probably be fasting from social media. Ooh, I felt the Holy Ghost on that. Uh, fasting from things that drain us and, and really seeking God and letting his Holy Ghost regenerate us, but also giving. As he comes out of giving, he begins to talk about people's money. And he says, you cannot serve both God and money. You will either serve one and hate the other or love one and hate the other. So then he gets into Matthew 6 where we're going to pick up and he starts talking about the needs of people. Starting in verse 25 is where I want to be with you today. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Pull out your Bible and here's what it says. Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry. That's my message. You miss your, I know, just a couple people got the amen moment, Mr. Rice. That needs to be the theme of your kingdom life this year. Therefore, Jesus says, do not worry. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you will eat, what you will drink. Don't worry about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food? I don't know, Jesus. I might have to argue with that on that one. Um, isn't the body more than clothes? He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I want to pause there and just add a, a, a Stephen addendum to that. But birds still work to eat. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Actually, no. Psychologists say that worry actually depletes your life on this planet. And why do you worry about clothes? This is not Jesus saying we need to be nudists. Okay, before y'all get excited, you're like, yes, strip it down, Jesus. He says, see how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor, Solomon was the richest man in, in the Old Testament days. He was not even dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes, then he changes it. Look, he doesn't just say flowers. He says the grass of the field. He lowers their classification. The, the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Where are we going to get toilet paper? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But verse 33, seek first. Don't worry about your life. Just seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It doesn't need you to worry about it. Amen. Matthew chapter 6 is so chaotic to me because it goes against our natural desire and understanding of how life works. If I don't worry about it, who's going to worry about it? And Jesus says, the Father's going to worry about it. I shouldn't say worry. He's going to know about it, and he's going to take care of it. And this Jesus asked these three questions, and I want to do this today. I want to answer for you three questions that worriers ask that the kingdom answers. Three questions that worriers ask that the kingdom answers. Answers. And so for all the worriers out there, this message is for you. First question they asked, Jesus said, is what shall we eat? This is a representation of provision. What shall we eat? Who will provide for me? God promises that he will provide for our everyday needs. In fact, Philippians 4.19 says, my God will meet all your need according to the riches of of his glory in Christ Jesus. I had a man one time who tried to argue with me that Philippians 4.19 is talking about spiritual riches. I said, that's awesome because everything that manifests in the physical starts in the spiritual realm. And so if he has spiritual things for me, it means he's got spiritual provision that'll manifest as finances if I need it. 
And if I don't have the finances to buy toilet paper, I've said it before, somehow toilet paper will show up in my front door. I don't know how. John 15, 7, Jesus said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is an indication that Jesus doesn't just care about our needs, but he also cares about our wants, our wishes. However, you have to understand that there's a strong difference between needs and wants. What shall we eat is a question of provision. And worriers ask that question every day. Will I have enough? Other people, though, they don't worry about will they have enough. They worry about will I have more than enough. And God promises both that you will have enough and I am the God of more than enough. What I've learned is this. When you're a part of the kingdom, God will provide your every need and he will test your every want. I'll use my own personal self as an example. One of the desires, my wishes, as it were, it's on my stretch card personally, is I want a BMW X5. Now, if you don't know this vehicle, it is a beautiful vehicle. The reason I want this is because I got to go on a trip in February of 2020. I was blessed, somebody blessed me, to be able to drive a BMW X5 brand new all week. And it's luxury, y'all. Like, I would live in it if I could. Just put a toilet and a refrigerator, I'm set. But I love this car. I love the vehicle. I love the way it drove. Uh, my favorite part was it had a heated steering wheel. Like, what? And here's the thing. I want that, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't need that. I have a 2012 Honda Civic basic model. Gets me where I need to go. It's great on gas mileage. It's a beautiful little car. It's trashy, but it's good. It gets me where I need to go. My need is met, but there's a want that I have. So if I don't need it, but I do want it, and here's the thing, everybody has a different perception because some people heard BMW and they were like, oh my gosh, oh, that's so gaudy. Oh, you don't need that as a pastor. Other people are rooting me on. They're like, get it, pastor, get that BMW. They want me to be blessed. Thank you for those of you who are following me like that. I don't need it, but I want it. So here's where we have to draw the line. If I don't need it, but I do want it, does that mean that God won't provide it? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at the next two questions that the kingdom answers. Your next question is this, what shall we drink? In Scripture, this is an understanding of fulfillment. We looked at this last week, John chapter 4, the woman at the well. What was she looking for? Fulfillment. Give me this water so that I don't have to come back to the well and be thirsty anymore. Worriers are always looking for fulfillment. In 1943, a psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow hypothesized on what he called the human hierarchy of needs. At the very top of this hierarchy is self-actualization, purpose, fulfillment, I don't want to be empty anymore. I need a reason to get up in the morning. There are people who have lost their purpose in the last 12 months. They don't want to get up in the morning. They don't have a job to go to. Family is a mess. COVID has wrecked their lives. The government has wrecked their lives. Everything is wrong. And I'm seeking out fulfillment. What will I what will I drink? What will fill me? What will fill this void that I have? But in the kingdom, we shouldn't be li living that because Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. If you go study Romans chapter 8, it's all about living a purpose-driven life with the Holy Spirit. And here's essentially what the writer of Romans says. He says, it's not about your purpose, it's about God's purpose. Most people are seeking their personal purpose, and that is why they are always left empty. Because God says, I will make all things work out for you when you embrace my purpose as your purpose, instead of trying to build your own purpose over my purpose. So let's go back to the question, does Stephen get a BMW X5. 
Does Stephen get to drive away in one? And some of y'all are thinking like at the end of the message, like somebody's gonna come up and surprise me and be like, you got one! Like, by the way, if that happens, y'all, that would be so cool. But we didn't plan that. Like we're not using the church funds for that. But do I get one? Well, here's the question. Do I want one because I feel like it'll fulfill me? Or do I want one because I'm already fulfilled? There's a lot of people who are wanting a job right now. Do do you want that job because you think that that job will fulfill you? Do you want that spouse because you believe another person will fulfill you? Do you come to church because you think that a church experience fulfills you? Or are you seeking out God's purpose for your life? Here's the struggle, though. Sometimes God's purpose means you go through a season of suffering, but that suffering is not so that you are in pain. That suffering is that you are stretched. It's uncomfortable. It's tension. It doesn't feel good, but God fills you in the middle of it. Philippians 4, the writer says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but we always miss what he wrote in verses 11 and 12. He said, I have been in plenty and I have been in lack. I have been in abundance and I have had nothing. I've been in prison and I've been free. And in all this, I can remain content because of Christ Jesus in me. Because I know his purpose. I'm fulfilled in every season. Why? Because I've got God's purpose. What will we drink? Who will fulfill us? But I said we have three questions. The last question is this. What shall we wear? This goes back to our image. Image is all about the perception of other people. When they see you, who do they see? What do they see? I grew up in Arlington, Texas, middle-class family, and my parents sacrificed a lot to put me through a small private Christian school. The school gave me a great education. The one reason we all hated the school, though, is because we had to wear uniforms. Now, when everybody is dressed the same throughout the day, it's okay. It's when you leave the school and you go to the mall and want to talk to cute girls, but you have khaki pants and a green polo on and a brown braided belt and brown loafers, it's not cute anymore. And so I always wanted to get out of my uniform because I didn't want people to think I was some kind of nerd, like weird kid who wore a uniform. And by the way, if you wear a uniform to school, God grace you. But it made me think of our image, right? Like, like how we are perceived by what we wear. And so I want to I do something today. Um, I'm going to I'm going to do this. So I want you to talk amongst yourselves for just a second. If you're online, uh, in the chat there, I want you to tell me uh, about the best uh, uh, meal you've ever made, okay? Here in the building, just take a second, talk to each other. I want you to tell each other about the best meal you've ever made. Give me a second here, because I I got some things I'm doing back here. If you'll just bear with me, it's okay. Yeah, you just take a second. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. What you got? Was it fried chicken with some good biscuits? Was it... um, what you got? Corn on the cob, mac and cheese. I love mac and cheese, by the way. You make me some mac and cheese. Not no box mac and cheese. I love mac and cheese box, but I really love like fresh cheese with like seven cheeses. That's good. Baked potato. Give me a good baked potato. I will take a baked potato any day. My wife doesn't know how to bake baked potatoes, so if y'all can, if y'all can help her, she's struggling with that. But. But then I should also help with dinner. That's the problem, too. Amen? Anyway, but I want you to think about that. Okay, 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 okay. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. I want you to think about this. If I come out... If I come out dressed like this... If you saw me walking down the street like this, what do you think I am? I'm a farmer, right? It's easy. I'm a farmer. Now, <laughs> now, here's the thing. With just a little bit of a change here, if you see me walking down the street and I look like this, what am I now? I'm a construction worker. Some of you are like, you're the village people. No, I'm the construction worker. <laughs> But here's the thing. If I show up walking down the street, oh goodness, y'all gonna tear this. And you see me, and I do a quick costume change. And 
and I'm dressed like this, what am I now? Some of you are like, you're an animal doctor for farmers, right? (laughs) But here's my point. Literally, with just a little bit of prop changing the outside appearance, your perception of me changes very quickly. I was a farmer. I was a construction worker. I'm a doctor. I'm none of those things. You need to thank God for that. (laughs) But all it took was just a quick costume change to say, oh, this is who I am. So, So let's go back. Does Stephen get a BMW X5? Hopefully not, y'all. Does Dr. Stephen does? Yes, Dr. Stephen does. He can afford that sucker. He's like, yep, sure can. Surely can here. Susanna does want me to have one. That's a great question, Miss Mary. She does. She's praying it in in Jesus' name. She's going to work. She's working overtime, three different jobs to make sure we can afford it too. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. Do I get one though? Here's the question. Am I getting one because I want you to perceive me as wealthy or affluent? Am I getting one because it's just, I enjoy it? Image is everything in this classification. We get on TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and we post the things we want people to see. It's all about image. I don't know if you saw this. This is how image works. There are some very uh, famous musicians, artists, Uh, uh, actors who have been renting a jet plane studio and they take a picture in this jet plane studio. It's particularly built for the wealthy so that they can say that they were flying in a private jet. Even though they didn't have a private jet, they did not fly in a private jet, They took a picture, put it on Instagram, and it was edited to look like that. Why? Because it's all about the image. Are you asking God for things because you want other people to perceive you a certain way? Or do you know, let's go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, who is Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The question you got to ask yourself is, do I want people to see me a certain way or do I want people to see Jesus a certain way? Does Stephen get his BMW X5? Absolutely. Let me tell you why. Because when I drive it around and people ask me, what do I do? I'm going to tell them I serve Jesus. And I honor him first with all the first fruits of my wealth. And I'm a consistent tither. And I love generosity. I'm extremely generous because God changed my heart a long time ago. And now I don't spend money to get things. I invest money into the kingdom so that his kingdom can grow. And then this BMW X5, this is just a side thing. This is not the desire of my heart. What my desire is, is that people know Jesus. Real people are introduced to the real Jesus. This is just a want. And if it does happen, awesome. If it doesn't happen, that's okay. Why? Because it's not my need. It is not my desire. I'm not doing it for your appearance. I'm just doing, God's just saying, yes, I'll get that for you. Why? Because you're my child and you put me first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things, all the purpose you need, all the fulfillment that you need, all the provision, come on somebody, that you need, the perception of others will change about you because you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Because when you are a part of the family of God, then the kingdom of God has all that you need. Need. Second Peter chapter one, this is where I'll end today. It says, His divine power has given us everything. Somebody say everything. Everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Jesus, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Does Stephen get his BMW X5? Well, the question is, 
Is it an evil desire caused by the corruption of this world so that other people will perceive me as successful? Does it fulfill me where God is not fulfilling me? Am I asking him to provide it so I can show it off? Or is the prayer of my heart, God, I already have everything I need in Jesus. I have everything I need in Jesus. I am completely fulfilled because I have your purpose, not my purpose. I live out your purpose every day. Everything I need, I have in Jesus. And so, God, I'm asking you for this BMW X5 because I will enjoy it. But even if I drove it for 60 minutes and I pulled into a parking lot and you said, give it to that person, because I seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, I will be obedient. God, I'm praying that everyone in our church that writes on these stretch cards, things that they are believing you for, that God, you would honor their requests. But I'm also asking, Holy Spirit, would you convict them to know that it will not fulfill them? And if at any moment moment you say, give it all away, they would be obedient. Do you have everything that you need? Or are you lacking because you don't understand a relationship with Jesus? Let's pray today as we dismiss. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to give your church a life of fulfillment. Purpose in the kingdom. Purpose for the kingdom. Purpose for the divine nature. To look more like Jesus. When people look at us, let them see Jesus. Not Stephen, not Mark, not Martin. Not Greg, not Caleb, not none of us here. Let them see Jesus in us. I am praying in the name of Jesus, God, that you would provide when it seems like there is no provision. I pray that we would stop getting our hearts in a twist waiting for a stimulus check when we know that you are the creator of the universe, that you are working all things out for our good. I pray, Lord, that we would not be concerned with our own image, but we would bear the image of Jesus in these days to come. Lord, I pray that you would fulfill us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would serve you faithfully in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're watching online or you're here today, you say, Stephen, I do not feel fulfilled. I spent the year 2020 looking for something to fill me and everything I did failed then let me encourage you today. I know I look silly here for a moment, but just let me encourage you. There's nothing like living a life, not just for Jesus. You're not just serving a king. He's not some distant God. You're living a life and serving with Jesus. Like he is with us. And I know people make fun of that and they're like, I don't understand it. I honestly don't understand it. I've been with Jesus for a long time. I still don't understand exactly how it works, except that his grace is so awesome. He wants to be with me. Even when I do mess up, his desire is to live a life with me, to live through me. And that's why I live for him. So I can wake up this year, even when I wake up to fires in the Capitol and rioting in the streets and wars and rumors of wars, I can wake up every day still fulfilled, not fearful, not anxious, not worrying. I've woken up many times in my life without a job. I've woken up many times without food in the fridge or in the pantry no money in the bank, actually negative numbers in the bank. I've I've been there. And it wasn't until I understood that all those things are fading and they're passing away, but a real life-giving relationship with Jesus gives me purpose. If you're watching today and you're like, I need a job, I need money, I need food, I need clothes, I need all these different things. I'm praying that you get those too But when you serve Jesus, you stop looking to the world as your provider and you start looking to God as your provider. And he can make a way where there is no way. He can have supernatural results. You'll get a job interview for a job no one else knew about, but somehow they found you. There'll be money sitting on your front porch. There'll be groceries that will show up unexpectedly. I know because that's what's happened with me, miracle after miracle after miracle. And so I wanna ask you today, if you have not chosen to follow Jesus, to surrender your life to him, would you do that with me today? I wanna lead you in a prayer very simply, line 
by line. I want you to repeat after me, but if at any time in this prayer you say, hey, Stephen, I need to take a break. I need to talk to God for a moment. Do that. Pause this, come back, but have this moment with God. But for the sake of those who are making this decision today, here in this building, can we pray together as a church family? Repeat after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today admitting I have sinned, admitting I've done wrong. I'm empty, but I'm asking you to fulfill me. Forgive me of my sins. Purify me from all unrighteousness. Give me new life. Be my provider. I commit to follow you. You are the king. You're number one. Adopt me into the family. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the thing, if you pray that prayer, you might be like, okay, no angels are singing. There's no light shining on me. Or maybe it started snowing outside your window right now. You're like, whoa, like, that may not have been God. I don't know. Um, but I do want to tell you this. When you act in faith and you pray that prayer for God to forgive you, to be a part of your life, this is where things begin to change. But it's like soil that just got tilled up. Now you're fresh to receive new seed and watering. But if you don't do anything with that soil in your heart, it's just going to leave empty. And you're going to wonder why in a year things are back to the same way. So what I want you to do is I want you to connect with us. Talk to somebody in the chat and say, hey, I made that decision. I need some help. Pray with me. Get with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Connect with us. Come back online. Because this year, we are building more resources for those who make this decision. We want to walk with you daily. We want to be here with you. Even if you're at, in a different country, you're in a different state, different time zone, we want to be the church that is there to be with you as you discover who Jesus really is. We want to introduce you to the real Jesus. And that's not just a one-time encounter. So come back with us next week, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Be with us live, and we're going to keep on feeding you, keep on connecting with you through the week. Hey, I hope you got something out of that message. I told you I'd end a little early today. Um, those of you online, I know that uh, this doesn't apply to you, but if you're here today and you want to get baptized, we want to do that with you. If you said, you know, Jesus, I commit my life to you, and now I want to make a public declaration, it would be my honor to baptize you. And in fact, we have someone who's here today who's getting baptized that I'm really excited about. And so I want to ask you, if you're in person today, if you'd stick around and celebrate with her today. If you're watching online, if you're ever going to be in the DFW area and you want to get baptized, go to the Revive app, click on the Connect section, let us know. We'll plan it out far in advance if that's how you want to do it. That way we can baptize you. But if you want to be baptized today here in this house, we are ready to do that. I'm so glad that you tuned in today. I hope you listen to this message over and over. I hope that it can become seed planted in your heart and it does not just fade away, but it takes root and accomplishes God's purpose in your life. In Jesus name, the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up your countenance upon your people. In Jesus name, give us grace and peace. Amen and amen. We'll see you next week.